In the beginning. <laughs> no, 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 not that far back. There was a man. A man named Dan. Dan Clifford was a canny young fellow who got into the paper game at the tender age of 11. And by 1916, he had amassed the capital sum of 800 pounds, which was sufficient to lease his first two picture houses. Over time, his empire grew to 20 theatres, becoming the biggest sole controlled suburban circuit in Australia. And Dan was crowned with a stint as the president of the Motion Picture Exhibitors from 1932 to 1935. Shortly before the Second World War, Dan engaged architect Chris A. Smith, famed for his spiffy Art Deco style, to design an up-to-date picture theatre, conforming to the highest standards of present-day comfort for the pleasure-seeking people of Goodwood. And it was to be called the Savoy. Or would it? It seemed that Mr Smith was also designing a theatre on Rundle Street at the very same time that already had the rights to the Savoy name. Hmm, some internal comms issues there, methinks. <laughs> Thankfully, a mere stroke of the mighty pen gave us the new Star Theatre Goodwood. It officially opened on the 8th of October 1941, screening a movie about a horse with a flouncy name. The theatre's most exclusive feature, the special powder bars and cosmetic rooms for lady patrons. How wonderful. <laughs> the grand cruise ship design is a classic expression of the Art Modern era, a more streamlined development of the Art Deco style with circular portals and seating, semi-circular ticket boxes, lovely cove lighting and a grand staircase with intricate metalwork. The original 1,472 seats, which is double the current capacity, provided more than ample legroom between every row and the individual lounges were described as deep and luxurious. The original stage treatment was proclaimed to be one of the finest in the state. The main curtain was old gold English satin with an additional festoon curtain fashioned of beige English silk. The mask was a deep burgundy velvet all set within the backlit proscenium arch. Now, convection heaters were installed on both levels, not just the ground, which was believed to be the first in a theatre. Air in the theatre was kept continually circulating up through the beautiful plaster vents in the ceiling through a system of large natural draft ventilators with fresh air drawn in through the big circular windows. The deep wall-to-wall -wall carpet was ordered from England well after the war was declared, but it arrived within three months, accompanied by a large paper sheet printed in colour and bearing the words, Britain delivers the goods. Both ladies' powder rooms had exquisitely exotic decorations and were staffed with an attendant from Lornay Cosmetics. Other materials such as bricks were in shortage due to the war and so alternative products had to be sourced. In order to complete the building on time for its opening, some contractors had to work long hours of overtime at much inconvenience, where of course defence contracts had taken all priority. Attendances at cinemas were good during the war years, as this was a, a really great form of escapism, where one could forget the harsh realities of the rationing and, and being separated from loved ones fighting overseas. Sadly, Mr Clifford passed away in 1942, and the family sold the theatre circuit a few years later in 1947 to Greater Union Theatres, for £179,000. In the preceding years, the theatre changed names, but the building remained the same. The rising popularity of television saw a number of cinemas close with the grand old buildings finding new life in fruit, vegetables and groceries. 
In 1967, in order to compete with in-home entertainment, the theatre was renamed Cinema Capri, the international cinema, showing mostly foreign films. These modern times required a modern look. So much of the beautiful Art Deco detailing was stripped out or covered over, including the lighting, the mirrors, the carpets, the plasterwork, even the ticket box grills. And the foyers were decorated with montages of travel posters and the usherettes wore traditional Italian costumes. The candy bar was extensively modified and extended into the foyer, making room for some tables and chairs in what was then called the coffee bar, ooh la la. Five huge chandeliers of Czechoslovakian crystal were salvaged from the Norwood and Parkside Star Theatres and suspended from the ceiling to add a little bling. The next decade saw cinema attendances in further decline, which led to a short stint of showing <clears throat> R-rated films before the theatre was closed in 1978. Yes, I did say R-rated films. Are you still with us? Good. <laughs> this is riveting stuff. The theatre's demise provided a rare opportunity for a motley crew of enthusiasts from the Theatre Organ Society of Australia, South Australian Division Incorporated, to realise a dream, a pipe dream. Now, for those of you not in the know, the theatre pipe organ was invented to replace orchestras that were employed to accompany the silent movies of the time. One person playing the organ could recreate the sound of an entire orchestra for only one wage. This innovation obviously led to self-service checkouts. True story. Back in 74, the team had purchased a theatre pipe organ with a long, long history. The pipework originated from the Winter Garden Theatre in Brisbane in 1924, then moved to the Plaza Theatre in Sydney, then spent some time in Mr Penhuser's jazzy lounge room in Sydney, where he added more pipes from other organs and this lovely console from Melbourne's State Theatre in 1928, recognise it? Which was then packed into a bus and shipped off to the Fitzner residence in Darwin, where it was installed under his tropical house for a spell. The organ was then rescued from its damp surrounds by the stylishly attired Tosa Saviors, who packed it up and drove it home, just weeks before Cyclone Tracy hit. Now, you'll be relieved to know that the Fitzners survived that storm in that very empty organ chamber. <laughs> Fuel. The restoration process began, as well as the hunt for a home for their mighty Wurlitzer. So, fast forward to 1978, when the cinema Capri's glamour had faded. Tosa swooped in and snapped it up after scraping together loans from the bank and various generous members. The newly named The Capri Theatre opened on the 26th of December 1978, screening Gone with the Wind, Convoy and Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown. The earnest work of installing the beautiful organ began, with the majority of the work being undertaken on a volunteer basis. The proscenium arch that had been covered many years earlier had to be demolished for the organ chambers to be built, with work often happening before and after movie sessions and sometimes during the sessions, with hammering planned for the battle scenes in Gone with the Wind. The organ was played for the first time at the inaugural concert on Saturday the 2nd of April 1983, with the console placed on the floor right in front of the screen. The illuminated pipework displayed in the organ chambers is the only installation of its kind in the world in a theatre. It wasn't until 1986 that the stage was built and the organ console would rise up on a lift to play before the movie sessions 
as you see here today. It was that same year that a little indie Australian film called Crocodile Dundee became a surprise hit. In the first week, the Capri broke the record for takings in a suburban theatre. And the movie went on to screen every day for 54 weeks. And this allowed Tosa to pay back its bank loan more than 10 years earlier than expected. Thank you very much, Mr Mick. In 1990, this architectural icon was placed on the Register of State Heritage Items because of the sleek modern combined with the luxurious Hollywood style of the building. The last 40 years have been spent lovingly restoring the old girl back to her original state, using the beautiful black and white snaps and the building journal from the first opening. Walls have been painted, plasterwork uncovered and restored, furniture, ticket box grills, lighting, mirrors and the fireplace all perfectly replicated. There have also been some modern improvements for your comfort, your belly, and for the next generation to enjoy. All of this has been achieved by a dedicated group of volunteers who give so generously of their time. Today, the Capri exists as a not-for-profit with all monies invested back into the restoration of this beautiful building and the preservation and promotion of the mighty Wurlitzer Theatre Organ. We do so hope that you love her just as much as we do.